Fine. Okay. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Welcome to Dow 2002 CPD webinar series. Um, welcome to all participants and speakers who have uh, joined today. We have two excellent speakers, um, very interesting presentations. Um, we have uh, with us Dr. Zafar Usmani from Australia and Dr. Maz Abid from UK. Dr. Usmani is a um, uh, respiratory uh, consultant and, and specialist in sleep medicine. And Dr. Maz Abid is a dermatologist from England. So first presentation is from Dr. Zafar Usmani uh, on the topic of snoring, sleep apnea, CPAPs. This is an interesting topic. It's very common. I think it's probably underdiagnosed. We see a lot of patients. Certainly I see a lot of patients in acute medical units whom I suspect that they have um, kind of sleep apnea. They look a bit obese. They are snoring. Sometimes they have hypertension. And you are never too sure. Sometimes I calculate Epworth scores to see what's going on. But obviously, I'm not a specialist. And then we seek advice. So um, thank you very much, uh, Zafar, for joining. And over to you and give us an overview of what exactly is this sleep apnea and, and how to manage and diagnose and all that. Thank you. Okay, no worries. Thank you, Naseem, and thanks, Mansoor. Assalamu alaikum for especially adjusting the time according to my time in Australia. I think it's a bit early for you guys. I can see some of you have just woken up. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, look, um, Naseem and Mansoor asked me to basically cover the sleep apnea, mainly the practical aspects. So, I'm, I'll try my best not to go to the nitty gritty and details of too many studies and we'll just try to cover more of a generalist practical aspects. So we'll just start with what sleep apnea is. So sleep apnea or obstructive sleep apnea is characterized by repetitive complete or partial closure of upper airways when we're sleeping. So basically that leads to the desaturation at night time, which in turn leads to sleep fragmentation uh, which we basically call as apnea hypopnea index. So if there's a complete closure of upper airways detected on a sleep study, we call it apnea. If there's a partial closure, then it's hypopnea. And together we calculate how many times a person or a patient is doing that, and that's called as an AHI. So a normal person could do that, but not more than five times an hour. And if this is more than five times an hour, then this is what sleep apnea is. If this is associated with daytime sleepiness, then this is uh, sleep apnea, hypopnea syndrome. So basically when you hear about the syndrome of sleep apnea, it's not like any other syndrome like we hear, but it's mainly the in elevated AHI with sleepiness. OSA is quite prevalent, particularly in the Western world. Um, and about one in five people are suffering from some degree of sleep apnea. Even a Brazilian study showed that in Brazil, it was up to one, one out of three people were suffering from some degree of sleep apnea, not necessarily severe sleep apnea, but they had at least mild sleep apnea or they had mild sleep apnea with symptoms or severe sleep apnea. It is much more common in male patients and African Americans. Let's talk about the risk factors for sleep apnea. So all of us, even the medical students would know that the, the most common and the most well-known risk factor for sleep apnea is obesity. Um, and a weight gain of 10% from the baseline would lead to an increase in AHI by 30% or 32%. And similarly, a weight loss of 10% would reduce the AHI by 26%. So it has a significant impact. Alcohol and sedative medications are other known factors. However, they on their own would not cause sleep apnea. But look, it would make it worse, for example, by suppressing the central respiratory control centers uh, when we're sleeping. If someone has sleep apnea, if they have alcohol, they probably would have much more AHI on that night, or if they're on opiates, then the severity would be much more higher. So the most important and the most common risk factor is obesity. However, there are other risk factors, including anatomical and physiological risk factors, which are usually um, being ignored, in, in particularly in the clinical practice, particularly in the primary care as well. So one of them is, is basically uh, the, the oropharynx anatomy. And you know some people might look thin, thin, but they have a big tongue. 
they have low lying hard palate or they might have significantly large soft palate so examination is very important when we're thinking about sleep apnea so that's another important risk factor what happens in people with sleep apnea particularly who are big what they get is an mri i'm not sure if you guys can see it properly but you can see this here there is a space there's no obstruction when the person is lying flat whereas here because of the subcutaneous fat the tongue is bigger and you can even see an obstruction over here so as i said there are lots of other factors in addition to obesity um and the uh, oropharyngeal um, anatomy and one of the other risk factors which is usually been studied nowadays is what we call as craniofacial anatomy so for example we see lots of chinese people they come to us and they have a normal bmi and when we do sleep studies on them they have quite severe degree of sleep apnea so this study was performed in australia and hong kong so one sleep lab in australia was selected and they had about 75 patients and another sleep study in hong kong had 75 patients um and we basically adjusted um the sleep apnea severity or ahi so when the sub analysis was performed for the matched ahi like from the caucasian population from australia and chinese population in hong kong for an ahi of 23 this is a caucasian population they had a bmi of 30.7 whereas the same ahi chinese population was getting a bmi of 28 so which means in addition to weight there is some other factor and we all know that chinese have different uh, mandibular size and they have different craniofacial features so this is pointing towards um, basically even the external craniofacial features the maxillary sound length and the mandibular length and the nose anatomy that's very important when we study the upper airway lining of the sleep apnea patients we found that their airways are usually dry even in clinical practice you will see sleep apnea patients they come and say look i wake up with very dry mouth so some of them would be dry because they are basically mouth breathers and their nose is blocked but some of them basically would physiologically have very dry upper airways so when they have dry upper airways it makes their upper airway lining very collapsible so they have a high surface tension and because of the high surface tension when they go to sleep it makes the upper airways more collapsible because of that we actually connected these patients with shogren syndrome patients so as we know that patients with shogren syndrome they have dry eye and dry mouth syndrome so we basically selected female patients with shogren syndrome in this study and this was my study and then each of them actually brought another female patient bmi matched and they had sleep studies and obviously what we did that is compared their ahi and then we took their surface tension as well what we found that patients who had sleep apnea and shogren syndrome patients who had shogren syndrome have much more ahi you can see here 18.6 as compared to 9 9.9 so that's significant difference 0.002 so if you see a patient with shogren syndrome and she is complaining of tiredness it could be her rheumatological condition or shogren's but then sleep apnea should should be considered as well there are other physiological factors for example the body's own compensatory mechanism some people would have as when we sleep obviously there is some suppression of respiratory center and some people's physiology and central brain system would basically cause overcorrection you know as sometimes happens in central sleep apnea so that overcorrection would lead to more collapsible airways and ventilatory instability so basically what i'm trying to say if we talk about the risk factors of sleep apnea yes obesity is the most common risk factor but then if someone is not big they are slim and they have symptoms of snoring or tiredness we should still think about sleep apnea as there are lots of other anatomical and physiological factors which do play a role into it so if we move on towards um the diagnosis of sleep apnea it's no different than any other medical condition so we have to go through a process of obviously history and examination and uh, testing and then obviously we go to management so the most common presenting symptom 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 for sleep apnea patients is snoring which is mostly reported by the partners obviously partners do report the patient is having apneas i mean patients very rarely report and they gasp for breath they wake up unrefreshed and tired morning headaches and fatigue and daytime tiredness other symptoms 
However, when we see a patient with sleep apnea or tiredness, we should really focus on their total sleep time and what time they're going to bed. Are they shift worker or not shift worker? What medications they're taking? Because sometimes their tiredness and sleepiness is not because of sleep apnea. It's just because they're not sleeping enough hours or they're just shift workers or they have other problems like delayed sleep phase syndrome or they just body clock is different. So, or sometimes people are on so many opiates or antidepressants that's making them sleepy. Untreated depression itself can make people very tired as we all know. So basically the history for sleep apnea, you really have to establish about their total sleep time, their sleep habits, are they watching TV on the bed or what they're doing? So that's very important. Examination wise, you don't expect really much in sleep apnea patients, except for the examination findings that you would expect in obese patients. So obviously increased waist circumference and central obesity sometimes and you know, oropharyngeal, basically um, a collapsibility or melampathy score. But in addition, you can probably see um, some tonsillar hyperplasia as in the ENT examination or pulmonary hypertension is quite commonly seen. But if pulmonary hypertension is only because of sleep apnea, you would expect mild degree of pulmonary hypertension. So if you're seeing a patient with sleep apnea, they have severe pulmonary hypertension, there might be something else happening. In terms of diagnosis, um, before we go for the, the, the gold standard uh, test for sleep apnea, I think there are lots of screening questions which are being used. And ESS is most commonly being regarded as, as a screening question for the sleep apnea, whereas ESS is not a screening question for sleep apnea. It is merely a patient's subjective estimate of their own daytime tiredness or sleepiness. So they basically grade their, their chance of falling asleep you know, under various conditions when they're sitting and reading or when they're watching TV or when they're driving between zero to three. So it varies actually, you know, if a patient is tired or they might just number it high, it ranges between zero to 24. Anything less than eight is normal between eight to 16. We say normally they are mild to moderately tired. More than 16, you actually have to think about uh, narcolepsy and things like that. So the point here is ESS or effort score is not a screening question for sleep apnea because people with untreated depression, people on opiates, people who are shift workers, their ESS would be elevated as well. So ESS though, it helps in finding out how the patient's symptoms were before treatment and after treatment. However, it cannot be used as a screening tool for sleep apnea. So what are the actual screening tools for sleep apnea patients? And hence we come to the STOP questionnaire, which was initially investigated in surgical population. So what, it's a, basically four questions, very simple to ask. Do you snore? So S is for snoring. T is for tired, do you feel tired? O is for, has anyone observed you stopping breathing? And B, have you ever been treated for blood pressure? So if the patient actually has a score and each question gets one mark. So if they score two out of four, then it means their risk of sleep apnea is higher. This had further been actually um, made a bit more strong by adding some of the examination findings. For example, stop and then we added bang, B-A-N-G, so B for Body mass index, are they obese? BMI of more than 35. A for age, are they over 50 years of age? And for increased neck circumference, more than 40 centimeters. And then G is for gender. If they are male, they get one extra point. So this is gender discrimination. But anyway, so if they score more than five on the stop bang, then they are very likely to be having some degree of sleep apnea. So if you look on this chart, the sensitivity of a stop for a mild sleep apnea is 65, but for if you use a stop, and if that's more than two, if you do a sleep study, then 80% sensitivity is there. Whereas if they, they basically score more than five on a stop bang, then obviously the sensitivity goes up to 100% for severe sleep apnea, so very less likely to miss a, miss a severe sleep apnea patient there. So that's a really good screening questionnaire stop bang. However, as I said, you know, that there is a bit of a bias of male gender. So, you know, sometimes female patients, they, they come all in the primary care, they don't have much time to basically do all the examinations and do the circumference. So one of my colleagues in Australia, she has designed this questionnaire, which is very good. It's called OSA 50 questionnaire. It's also validated and being frequently used now in the sleep medicine communities. 
So what it says basically if O is for obesity and we mainly go for the waist circumference which are different parameters for male and female and you get three points if you are obese. S is for snoring, you again get three points for snoring. A is for apneas, you get two points for it. And then age is above 50. So there's no gender discrimination here. So basically out of a total of uh, 10 points, if you get five points, again, you get higher risk of getting sleep apnea. So this is a very easy to use questionnaire and we, this is increasingly being used and this is what I would probably recommend. So let's see if a patient comes to you, he gives history of tiredness or snoring and you've taken a good history and do ruled out any other things then basically you can basically do OSA 50 and if that's how I can refer a patient for sleep study. However, there are lots of other things which are happening and there's a research happening to see if we can basically screen patients for sleep apnea with any other modalities. So this is an interesting study which in which they use body anthropometry and the craniofacial phenotyping or photography by taking photographs of all the patients who were coming to the sleep lab and then measure their mandibular length and then various other parameters. And they went to the sleep study. And after then, the sub-analysis was performed based by, after matching for their BMI. And then what we found that the controls had much more longer length of the mandible as compared to sleep apnea patients. So now this tool could be used, this is used in research at the moment, but then, you know, this could be used in future if we may be able to get those cameras in which we just sort of take a photograph and that would give you numbers of mandible and everything else. And those patients who have short mandible length, you know, could be sent for a sleep study. The biomarkers are very popular these days. So cysteine has been studied in sleep apnea patients and early morning cysteine levels were significantly elevated um, in sleep, severe sleep apnea patients as compared to mild or normal patients. But cysteine itself is a biomarker for cardiovascular disease itself. So it's very hard to say that their, their cysteine was elevated just because of sleep apnea or they really had a metabolic syndrome or other cardiovascular problems. But this is also under study. So in a few years time, you might find out that there will be some other screening modalities available for sleep apnea patients. So however, the gold standard test to diagnose a sleep apnea is the polysomnography or a sleep study in which patients get observed overnight, basically, and monitored overnight. So what they do is we get to, to monitor their sleep state. So they get EEG, they get EMG, so they get a mus muscle tone monitoring, they get eye movement monitoring, just to basically classify what sleep stage are they going. Then they also get monitoring of sleep position because that's very important. Are they sleeping on their back or sides? And then we measure the nasal flow and oxygen saturations. And based on that, basically then they get the scoring. And then we say, look, this patient has an apnea, hypopnea index of more than 30 or more than five or not. However, it is very important to actually see that if a patient has come to you, you were suspecting with sleep apnea, they went and they had a sleep study, which is normal. But if you have a high pretest probability, then you need to look at the sleep study whether the patient actually had had supine sleep. Because sometimes what happens is patients are at home sleeping on their back. When they go to sleep lab, because of all the leaves, they don't sleep on the back. And some patients might just have a supine sleep apnea. And you might get that that test is, is basically sort of false negative. Or they might not have gone into REM sleep and they might just have REM sleep apnea. So it is very important though the sleep physician would have reported or should have reported in a way. But we really should consider when if we get as a specialist or as a, as a medical resident that we're seeing in someone's sleep study, which is not matching the clinical situation, then it is very important to look into a bit more details to see if this patient had achieved enough sleep, this patient had supine sleep, or this patient went to REM sleep. <laughs> or if they don't have sleep apnea, they have periodic lumen movements, which, you know, which might be, again, causing sleep fragmentation and very same symptoms in the daytime. So sleep apnea and cardiovascular risk factors is, is a pretty popular topic and I probably would not have time to go into the details of that. But how, what happens is patient when we're sleeping and when, when there's sleep fragmentation, it leads to basically sympathetic stimulation of the entire body system. And then there's a ventilatory overshoot, there's hypoxia, which leads to increased inflammatory markers and, and metabolic hyperactivity and then leads to basically hypertension, atrial fibrillation. So basically the most common factor from the cardiovascular perspective, which we know is associated with sleep apnea is hypertension and atrial fibrillation. 
So hypertension, if you treat patients with sleep apnea, you might not sleep apnea and hypertension, you might not see a significant drop in their mean blood pressure. But there is significant reduction in incident hypertension in patients with sleep apnea. For example, if you have 10 patients with sleep apnea and 10 normal patients, if you don't treat the sleep apnea patients, they are more likely to develop hypertension down the track than the non-sleep apnea patients. Similarly, atrial fibrillation is up to four times more common in sleep apnea patients. So these are the two cardiovascular associations which are more common and, and proven by research. There's more research been happening about the strokes and um, ischemic heart disease itself, but that's not been significantly proven in a large randomized controlled trials. There are a few studies that are showing insulin resistance and CVA uh, association with sleep apnea. So in terms of management, uh, the management of sleep apnea again starts with a very basic the lifestyle modifications, so obviously when we see a patient with sleep apnea, weight has to come. So we have to talk to them about, look, you need to lose your weight. You have to work on sleep hygiene. It does not matter if they wear a CPAP machine, but if they're still watching TV or they're drinking alcohol before they're going to bed, they will still wake up and refresh. If they're not sleeping seven hours, only sleeping three hours, they will still wake up and refresh. So it is very important to talk to them about the lifestyle modifications um, and reduction in alcohol, losing weight. As I said before, a weight loss of 10% would lead to a one-fourth of the uh, reduction in AHI. So that's very important. If that's not working, if patients otherwise comply with CPAP, then obviously sometimes we can think about bariatric surgery as well. But the gold standard treatment or the most effective treatment for sleep apnea is CPAP. CPAP would be the most effective treatment. What it does, it just creates a splint. So you, you get a positive pressure of air and when airways are collapsing, whether for a physiological reason or anatomical reason, it would cause a splint and the, the upper airways would not collapse. So your lungs had good oxygen, everything is reversed. As simple as that, it's opposite of vacuum cleaner. So, so CPAP is the most effective treatment, though other treatments like mandibular advancement, splint or ENT intervention are available. But if someone's AHI is, is baseline AHI is 50, <laughs> CPAP would bring it down to 0 0.5 or 1, whereas MAS mass would bring it down to 20. So it is the most effective treatment. And it does improve the quality of life of patients with sleep apnea to a significant extent. But we have to understand that this is not a most um, pleasant experience, you know, particularly for young patients to have something on their face. Uh, some people would just be claustrophobic. So you have to basically work with the patient to teach them the importance of the CPAP and why they are using this machine. Talk to their partners to support them, give them education. We do have CPAP desensitization program. Sometimes sleep psychologists help them getting used to CPAP. There's a medication called Zopiclone, which is a non-sedative hypnotic. Sometimes we can use it for up to first four to six weeks in anxious patients just to get rid of their anxiety when they're putting the CPAP on. So this study basically showed increased CPAP adherence. So the major problem we have with CPAP is the you adherence. Have one minute. Sorry, Nassim? You have one minute. But yeah. So... As I said before, the supine sleep apnea is more common. So if you see a patient with supine sleep apnea, you don't have to start them on CPAP. There are supine avoidance uh, devices available. So basically, it just goes around their chest. When the patient is on their back, it gives them a vibration, they roll over. As I said, mass is available, ENT intervention. They're not as a strong treatment as a CPAP. Um, there's new therapies like a pacemaker, hypoglossal nervous stimulation, which has been studied in a study in the U.S., so when you get a transducer attached uh, to the trachea, and then you've got a stimulator subcutaneously. So when, as soon as the AVS collapse, basically stimulates hypoglossal, genoglossus muscle, hypoglossal nerve, and that's basically constricts, create more space. It has lots of complications. So the key points would be that sleep apnea is a common chronic condition, particularly in the Western world. There are more risk factors other than obesity, so including physiological factors, mandibular length, ESS is not a screening question for sleep apnea. The actual screening questions are stop bang and um, OSA 50. The gold standard test for sleep apnea is overnight sleep study. CPAP is the best treatment for sleep, sleep apnea so far. However, there's more research happening. But mandibular advancement screen and ENT interventions could be considered in patients who are not called into CPAP. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zafar. Thank you. So Zafar, if you please stop sharing your screen, so mm -hmm. mask could start.
Um, Mas, uh, please share your screen. Can you guys see now? Yes, we yeah. can. Okay. Excellent. So the next speaker we have is Dr. Maz Abid, consultant dermatologist, and he's going to be talking about rashes, papules, nodules, and other things, lumps and bumps. And he wanted to be a very interactive um, uh, presentation. So um, he might be asking us lots of questions, what we think. <laughs> I think most of us are non-dermatologists. Um, I believe GP and general physicians may have better idea of a few things, but most of us are very non-specialists. So Mas, uh, please start. Mas, be, be, don't be heavy handed, all the best. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mansoor and Naseem for inviting me and uh, really well done, Zafar. Uh, great presentation. So uh, I'm going to present uh, today uh, on some common rashes and uh, lumps. So welcome to the world of uh, dermatology. Uh, skin diseases are incredibly common and uh, important. And some of you may be a bit surprised uh, to know that there are almost uh, 200, uh, 2,000 skin diseases reported in the literature. It is uh, one of the commonest uh, presentation to the general practice in the last uh, uh, GP morbidity statistics uh, showed that uh, skin diseases was the commonest presentation in general practice. And uh, epidemiological studies uh, have shown that skin disease can affect uh, 30 to 70% of the individual depending on where they live. So my main aim of this talk is uh, uh, to discuss some common dermatological diseases and I hope that it will improve your diagnosis and make, your, make you more confident in treating skin diseases and also help you make appropriate uh, referrals to the dermatology team. So I'm going to go with sort of 10 cases and uh, I think Mansoor have shared uh, uh, with, uh, with you some photographs uh, of uh, those cases. And uh, I'm not going to pick anyone. I think I'm just going to ask for volunteers. So whoever who wants to uh, you know, go with ex an explanation of the lesion or description, please feel free and you can stop me as well if you've got any questions. So it's, I like to make it more interactive uh, just to, uh, for you to remember things. And I think that is, uh, uh, we were going to see how it goes with more interactive. If it doesn't work, we can go back to the you know, conventional uh, presentation. Okay, so, just, uh, Mars, just before you proceed, just, uh, just one small point. Um, mm -hmm. If you want to contribute, guys, uh, on the right-hand side of your screen, you see the participants and unmute yourself. I have already unmuted all of you, but some of you are still mute. I think it's maybe yeah. because you have muted yourself. So yeah. Yeah. Um, unmute yourself and contribute, but please make sure that the, the, there is no background kind of noise because uh, it affects you know, the presentation. So uh, please do contribute by all means, uh, but make sure the background noise is, uh, is kept to the minimum. Okay. All right, so this is the case one. Uh, 25 years old ma uh, male uh, uh, gentleman uh, presented with this itchy, scaly rash for the last six weeks. He's an outdoor worker. The rash is progressively getting worse. So, and this is what we see in the plain examination. One on the left side, you can see uh, there's a more, more. Uh, there's a photo photograph for the rash, and uh, on the right side, more close up. So, anyone want to? You know, tell me what they see clinically. Uh, I want to describe uh, anyone. Senior. Any volunteer? Tinia Elba. Uh, Tinia Elba? Yes, I mean, Tinia, yeah. that's one of the, you mean to say Tinia Vesicula. That's more, more common. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Petriasis Vesicula. Uh, yes. <laughs> you, you're right, Petriasis Vesicula is the diagnosis and uh, uh, it's, one of the common yeast infection of the skin. And uh, you can see on the left hand side, the photograph is showing some hypopigmented uh, macules. You know, some are discrete and some are sort of coalescing together and making like a, a, a big plaque in the middle and the lower of the back. But the important thing on the right side, you know, on the close of photograph, uh, because sometimes you, if you don't have a close look, you can miss the scales. On the right side, if you look, it's more, you can see the scales, the ring of scales around the individual lesions, and that is called uh, cholerate uh, scale, which is a typical feature of Petrasis vesicular. 
So basically, as I explained to you, vitreous vesicular can be hypopigmented uh, and can be hyperpigmented. Uh, so hyper means uh, the, there is a lack of pigmentation. It's more common uh, to get hypopigmented in, in Caucasian skin and uh, uh, in, 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 in Asian skin. And hyperpigmented can happen in the uh, Caucasian skin. And uh, it is caused by malassezia yeast, which is present in our body. Uh, what happens is because of the humid environment, especially in summers, uh, the malassezia yeast, you know, produce, uh, production increases and it produces this uh, uh, yeast infection. Treatment is uh, topical ketoconazole or shampoo, uh, which we advise patients to wash the scalp and also wash the body as well. And uh, oral antifungal treatment is also uh, recommended if it's quite widespread. One thing to uh, warn patients is that pigmentation, either lack or hyperpigmentation or hyperpigmentation may take a few months uh, to return back despite the successful treatment. So any questions on petrisis vesicular? Anyone? Oh, any, any questions on it? And see, um, All right. I'm sorry, uh, Mars, uh, what about the age group? Uh, number two. Um, what about the age so, group? This child, you know, presented uh, to the pediatric uh, clinic uh, with the mom very worried about these lesions on his son. Uh, they've been there for the last four weeks, spreading mainly on the forehead uh, and around the periorbital areas. So, Mansoor, I would pick on you. Would you want to describe what you see? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I don't know why. Uh, so, I think I can see a child and um, a boy. I can see um, lots of... Um, uh, can I call them vesicles? Basically, that's um, uh, with a punctum, with a with a dot, with something indentation in inside them. And I think uh, for me, the spot diagnosis molluscum contagiosum. That's wow. great, Mansoor. Spot on. So you are right. It's not a vesicle. We call it as papule. Vesicle is fluid filled. So these are not fluid filled. These are sort of solid papule. So. Uh, vesicle is basically uh, is a, is a is a fluid fill, so they're not fluid fill. So I will call it as a papule. These are discrete papules, and then you are spot on uh, that there is indentation. This indentation is basically uh, what we call umbilication. So umbilic this is the umbilicated papules, and the key features of this is they look quite similar. All of them are very similar, so we call them monomorphic. So their their pattern and morphology is quite same. And it's quite common in children. And so this, this is the correct diagnosis. So molluscum contagiosum is a common viral infection that we see in children and young adults, sometimes in elderly patients as well, especially if they are immunosuppressed. Multiple crops of these pearly papules with umbilicated centers are scattered, you know, and they can spread as well. And they also exhibit carbonization. Uh, does anyone know about carbonization? Can anyone? Tell me what you understand by carbonization. So no. so carbonization is basically you get the uh, lesions where you get the area of any trauma, or if you make a scratch, the oh, lesions yes. develop there. Yes, so yes, yes. Yeah, now I remember. <laughs> I remember that as well. <laughs> so one of the features of molluscum as well, it's caused by pox virus. It's nothing to worry about. The important thing is to reassure the parents that most of them uh, will disappear, will go eventually. Uh, with time, sometimes it can take months and sometimes, you know, years as well. However, you know, we all, we all are parents and it, they want, and some of the, you know, really want some treatment and they want it gone. So uh, one of the common treatments that they can buy over the counter and also prescription is avail available is um, uh, Molydap, which has been used, which is used twice daily for two weeks. Uh, this is basically uh, a strong alkali. It contains potassium hydroxide. It makes the virus uh, inflamed and kill the virus, and then the immune system kicks in and get rid of the molluscum. Uh, other option is the cristocide cream, which is also a disinfectant. It is also available in uh, over the counter, but can be prescribed as well. Uh, that's also a disinfectant cream, which works, you know, uh, well for certain uh, molluscum. But the important thing is to warn the parents that it may not work because there's no guarantee that any treatment would work. And then there are some destructive treatment available, such as cryotherapy, which is a liquid nitrogen. It's a minus 200 cold, cold burning, freeze, you know, freezing and cold burning. 
Uh, it's not suitable for young children because often the warts are not causing symptoms and cryotherapy certainly would cause pain and it's, there's, there's a danger that you can traumatize the, pay, uh, the child. So you have to be careful in, uh, in treating this uh, with cryotherapy. Only children who are uh, very keen and who, who, you know, who want this treatment, I, I, I only treat those. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, we basically are treating parents rather than children because children do get traumatized. Other, other option is topical imicomod, which is reserved for uh, as a last resort and is only initiated by the specialist. Topical imicomod cream is basically an immune system modifier. It's been used for skin cancer treatment as well. It's quite a very strong cream which makes things red and angry and it's got some systemic side effects as well. So this is imicomod cream is only reserved for, uh, uh, for specialists. So any questions on molluscum, anyone? No, I think it's all clear. All right, that's fine. So move on to the patient three. So this child, uh, again, this you know child has got this history of uh, scaly scalp and hair loss, uh, and also now developed uh, a two weeks history of this uh, uh, a lesion on the left side of the cheek near the uh, near the nose. So anyone would want to have a go at the description, you know, Nasim, why why don't you have a go? Um. It looks like maybe like a discoid type of rash. Um, his skin looks a bit dry. It's like a patch, mm -hmm. I would say. It's a patch. Yeah, um, that's a good on the on the scalp, is it? Or yeah. are you describing the face? Yeah, yeah, that's you're right. It's a patch. Discoid is a good description. I mean, a bit made, a bit more scaly. But what do you see? What happened to the hair? So there's hair loss in that area. Yes, it's a hair loss, and this is. Mainly, uh, it's a non-scarring hair loss. There's a, a scaly sort of patch there. And on the right side, if you see, you are also, you know, on the right side of the photograph, uh, you see this uh, annular, you know, uh, lesion. Mm -hmm. But what do you see on the border? Manasim, can you, you know, see the border? What, what, how would you describe the border? I on think it's like granulated. Yeah, it's, it's, it's granulated. You're right. It's no more, more sort of, uh, more, more raised, basically. It's more raised. Yes. It's an active edge to it. Central area is a bit clear. So this is a very typical of uh, what sort of infection we're talking about, uh, anyone's? Tinea? Yes, excellent, tinea. It's very typical of tinea. But what Nasim has pointed out is, is excellent uh, point, you know, discoid. You know, discoid lupus can look that, like this as well. And uh, sometimes discoid pattern eczema can look like that as well. Sometimes psoriasis can look like this as well as well. So the history is again important but this active edge, you know, is, is, is the key that gives, that's the big clue that this is a, a very much likely to be a fungal infection. So, so tinea capitis, so, you know, these, you can see scaly patches with non-scarring hair loss, uh, and there's an annular plaque with central clearing and active edges, commonly caused by the dermatophyte infection, trichophyton, tonsurans, microsporins, the common ones. And the key thing which I would recommend all, especially the general practice, you know, to uh, start doing skin scrapings and hair pluckings because that's something which can help us uh, identify the, uh, the organism and also then treat it appropriately. But, but just mind you that skin scrapings I have got can be negative as well. Uh, so if you see any kind of patient looks like some infection and, and the skin scrapings or hair plucking is negative, still we you know still treat them. Think about screening other family members as well and, and also ask about the pets and treat as needed. So the main treatment for scalp is oral antifungals. Just uh, terbinafine is considered first choice, four to six weeks of treatment. Uh, I think the key message is topical antifungal do not work for the scalp psoriasis because they do not penetrate the, the scalp uh, you know, skin. So it's not uh, uh, advisable to give topical because it's a complete waste of time. So oral antifungals is the treatment. But for the face or the or other parts of the skin, yes, you can give topical uh, antifungal treatment. And again, we advise shampoo as well. All right, so we're going to move forward to the next one. Uh, so this patient has got these uh, warts on the uh, right side of the foot, uh, and then he's also have, have this uh, warty lesion on the finger as well. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, who's around? And let me see. Okay. Lots, lots of people around. So you've already asked me and Nassim, lots of people around. Zafar, <laughs> your co-presenter. Co Zafar, yeah. Zafar, what do you think was going on on the with, with this uh, with this foot? No, this looks like a bit of a ulceration there. Zafar has gone to sleep, I think. 
Zafar? No, no, First of all, Zafar, this is not lungs. Ulceration <laughs> 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 the there, is it? Zafar, can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, he can. I can hear him, Maz. Can you okay. not hear him? I can hear him clearly. Oh, no, I can't I hear it. On the photograph on the right, there is some ulceration. On the foot or the or the finger? On the finger. Yes, you're right. The finger. I mean, it's. I mean, it's not ulceration. I would say. I would call it. It's quite warty. It's quite rough. It, this is classical hyperkeratotic. You know, this the, yeah. the terminology that we use. Like some yeah, the, the well. skin is producing. It's producing quite thickening. So it's quite hyperkeratotic, warty, <clears throat> warty plaque, and tending to the nails as well. And uh, compared to the foot, the foot has got these, these are typical Varukas. Uh, yeah. And uh, the classic features, features of Varukas is basically, you, uh, you may not be able to appreciate on the photograph, but you see <coughs> black dots. Black dots is characterized by thrombose vessels. So these are Varukas. Uh, wow. And nothing to worry about, we can reassure them. But what would, what would be the worry on the finger, you know? Anyone? Any differential for the finger that we would be worried about? And we want to take some actions. Um, is it um, uh, melanoma or could be a cancer? Cancer. Yes, it, it could be a cancer. Which cancer? Excellent. Squamous. Yes, excellent. It's set up, isn't it? That's brilliant. That's yeah. I would be worried about this being a SCC, the finger one, and it would need an urgent biopsy. So uh, these warts are caused by human papilloma virus, characterized by these warty rough papules, and the key features of these. Warts are black dots, thrombose vessels that we see. Uh, always try to, you know, make an active uh, uh, effort to look for these. Management is depend on the in whether they are symptomatic. They do resolve within 24 months uh, usually, and uh, and sometimes they do not treat, do not need any treatment. But if if you want to try treatment, uh, the key thing is paring it down on a regular basis by soaking in water every day, and then use the sandpaper or the pumice stone to file it every day and then use cell, topical salicyclic acid. They, they comes in various strengths. Uh, the most uh, uh, potent one is Verugan 50%, which, uh, you know, which can be prescribed, or Occlusal, which is 26%. Uh, and, uh, they, and, and they, and, but the important thing is it, it, it has to be used every day for a few months uh, to make uh, any difference. Uh, other thing that sometimes people is, uh, Gets, gets on well with duct tape, just covering it with a duct tape, you know, reduce the size. Uh, other options are cryotherapy, again, liquid nitrogen. It could be curettage and cauterize and remove. But always think of an SCC, squamous cell carcinoma, if it's on the nail bed, or it's, if it's symptomatic, rapidly getting bigger, uh, or, or if there's any unusual, uh, unusual uh, you know, uh, presentations, always think about an SCC. That's a key message from, from this case. So going on to the next case, uh, so this elderly gentleman, uh, lesion on the right, red lesion on the right cheek, gradually increase in size. Uh, it does bleed, and uh, and on while well, on examination on the back, skin survey showed some uh, other uh, lesion as well. So anyone want to describe the lesion? Yeah. So who's there now? Uh, Masam is there? Masam, uh, Masam, can you hear us? Masam, you have Masam. to, yeah, yeah, you have to unmute have to yourself. Go back to Mansoor again. Mansoor, would you want to describe it? <laughs> okay. Um, so I could actually see um, a lesion, which it? is um, bright red. I think uh, without touching the lesion, it could be maculopapilla. It's uh, quite pinkish. It's, um, uh, it's raised. It has got actually cleared uh, punctated margins um, with central clear area. Now, um, I'm not an expert a dermatologist, but I think I've got two differentials here. Could this be a squamous or a basal cell carcinoma? Mansu, you can be a dermatologist because you got it all, 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 all right. You know, that differential is absolutely fine, but it's a basal cell carcinoma because it's a relatively long history, five, six months, gradually getting bigger. Why is it be basal cell carcinoma? Is Mansu, it's not, we don't describe maculopapilla in terms of lesion. We describe it as papule or nodules in lesion. So this, okay. is, a, this is a nodule. And the uh, important thing is, if you look at the border and the color, can you see pearliness, any pearly or sort Yes, of I can, on the left one, air, on the left one. Edge to it, you know. On uh, the left one. On the top, you know, it's, it's difficult to appreciate in the photograph, but there is a pearly and whitish sort of shiny appearance. 
uh, that is typical of basal cell carcinoma. And one more important thing is you can see telangiectasia, small blood vessel. Can you see on the top uh, surface of yeah. the skin there? Uh, these are arborized telangiectasia uh, branching. Is Sorry? it this one? Is it this one that is that later becomes like rodent ulcer? Is it? Yeah, it's called rodent ulcer as well. Yes, it is called. It another name is rodent ulcer. And uh, these telangiectasias are arborizing, mainly basically the, they are branching like, and that's very typical of basal cell carcinoma. And so that's a nodular type of BCC. The one on the right is uh, a superficial type of BCC, which can just present with a flat macular or flat plaque, pink plaque like thing, a bit shiny. Uh, when you see it on the, on the, you know, closely on inspection, but that's uh, a superficial type. The different type of basal cell carcinoma is one of the very common skin cancers that we uh, encounter in UK. Almost 30% th chance of the in, in Caucasian population, you know, lifetime chance is 30%. There are different types. Nodular, you can see on the top, which we already seen. Superficial on the right side of the top. And then there's a morphic type. Morphic type of BCC are more deeper form of uh, skin cancers. They are like scars. You can see it's like a scar, and uh, but they are more deeper, and, uh, and 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 they are actually it's they are more spread out when what we see clinically, but and that's why sometimes it's uh, can be challenged to excise those uh, because we can't see uh, on the skin, and they are more deeper underneath, and it could be pigmented BCC as well, and one of the differential for the pigmented BCC, BCC would be a melanoma. But in the key thing is, again, looking at the edges, there is some pearliness as well. And the history would guide us whether uh, it's a long history. Usually with basal cell carcinoma, uh, if you're looking at the nose lesion, it's a pigmented between both the size, it will be at least there for a year. And uh, so it will be a relatively long history. A melanoma will be a short history uh, and it will look slightly different. So just to give you a brief overview of the types of BCC, Moving on to next one is a patient, six, 67 years old, male with a mole on the right temple, which has gradually got bigger. It catches uh, on, the, on the temple. Patient is worried about it. Uh, we had a look at it. And uh, also the skin survey showed some lesion on the back as well, which we've got on the right side. There are multiple uh, you know, uh, pigmented lesions. So uh, uh, anyone, anyone want to describe it? Or I think I can, I can describe it. Basically, these are, if you look on the lesion on the left side, you know, it's quite warty. The texture is warty. And how we describe this lesion is basically A, B, C, D, E. So A for asymmetry, B for border, C for color, D for diameter, and E for elevation. So A for asymmetry. Is it asymmetrical, guys, or is it symmetrical? Asymmetrical. Asymmetrical. No, I think what we have to do, the lesion is symmetrical because how you describe how you describe the lesion is basically in a lesion we have to divide the either you divide into medial or lateral half of the lesion and C or superior inferior or half of the lesion. So if you look at the lesion basically, if you divide it into right and left, it's same superior inferior, it's same more or less it's a symmetrical lesion, isn't it? Okay. Okay. Yes. So border is well defined. B for border. Border is well defined and regular. Again, color is uniform. Diameter maybe around five six centimeter. E for elevation. So the history is he had it for a long time. It is catching. It's gradually increasing in size. It's been referred at a two week skin cancer clinic. Uh, but I have reassured this patient. Anyone? Anyone? Anyone uh, volunteering a diagnosis or what to say? Any thoughts on the diagnosis, guys? I was having a look at this. I, I think this could be um, a melanoma, but because you said it's symmetrical, I'm, I'm a bit confused. So um, I don't know. It could um, be like keratoacanthoma, that, that kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> keratoacanthoma is a good thought, Nassim. The keratoacanthoma's history is, uh, is, is basically, it gets rapidly increased in size, becomes static, and then shrink. And uh, in, in, in keratoacanthoma, you see more hyperkeratotic center. So this is, uh, more warty. So have you heard of, uh, I think Asma might know, seborrheic warts, seborrheic keratosis. This is typical seborrheic warts and keratosis. Okay. Nothing to worry about. These, we tell patients, these are signs of wisdom and maturity. And, uh, <laughs> uh, they, and they seem to be ready. Sign of, sign of wisdom and maturity. Yeah, we have to put it in a, in a, you know, in a politically correct way. So they can be various color, various sizes, and they can mimic All of melanoma. Some point it looks that's, like why we, that's why we, we get a lot of this from 2B Cancer Clinic. And 
but they Father, never turn malignant i've learned okay? one thing today <laughs> so wisdom we have to really show the patient be, sorry wisdom yeah? cannot be spotless i've learned something today <laughs> oh, oh, oh. oh sakeb is joined that's good <laughs> sorry sorry zafar i missed your talk i was sleeping <laughs> no worries i understand it was too early for you guys man at least if you are not snoring in sleep that's fine <laughs> go ahead go ahead So basically, seborrheic keratosis. I mean, you you show the patient if they are symptomatic, we can scrape it off, keratage and cauterize, or remove it, or again use the cryotherapy. But one thing to learn from uh, one one message is if if the if the patient present it with uh, you know many many seborrheic warts within a few months, you know, then it can be a marker for internal malignancy. Uh, so so just be wary of that. All right. So we're going to make oh, Sake is here now. Sake. would you want to describe this lesion you know this is 75 years old gentleman with rough patches on the scalp and uh, uh, you see the you, you have a closer inspection you know so he's got these rough patches on the scalp and a closer inspection would you want to describe the closer inspection one you know sorry uh, has he got chest pain uh... <laughs> <laughs> no you okay. are referring you are referring okay. to me and i'm asking you how <laughs> the lesion looks like so how but would a, you describe a, 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 it a b a b c d e it's asymmetrical is border is irregular that's brilliant uh, uh, what was c mass color 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 i mean i have to magnify it but it looks a bit reddish on the side and then uh, what's in the middle what, what color like is it, it it's yellowish red i don't know that's brilliant it's yellowish brown yeah that's fine yeah ah, okay and then d is what was d diameter diameter probably 2 cm no it's smaller it's, it's smaller yeah, it's, it's probably, probably it's probably half a cm Yeah, half a centimeter to a centimeter. Yes, and agree I, on it. I I'm not sure if it's elevated. No, no I think it is elevated. It's uh, it is elevated. So it's like a plaque. We describe it as a plaque. It's a uh, it basically you know the, what your, what you describe this as yellow thing. Uh, it is basically a hyperkeratotic. Again, it's in a hyperkeratotic plaque with a pink base. So the diagnosis here is anyone want to volunteer a diagnosis here? Is it an elderly gentleman? Sun exposure over the years. I've got these solar solar keratosis. Actinic keratosis. Excellent, uh, Mansoor and Nasim. This is indeed actinic keratosis, or we call it solar keratosis. Chronic sun damage in common in fair skin individuals, characterized by the crusty red patches and plaques. Uh, it can regress in 20% of the cases by themselves. Uh, if untreated uh, they can progress to squamous cell carcinoma in about 10% of uh, the patients and the management is again you know education sun protection uh, simple moisturizer just helps with the low grade of actinic keratosis and then cryotherapy is one of the treatments again uh, for uh, for actinic damage uh, but we use special creams you know topical creams uh, these creams are called aphidex creams will be more interested for the gps i think Uh, Aphidex cream is five percent fluorouracil. It's a chemotherapy uh, cream. Picato has been used, and Acticarol has been used as well. And GPs can all prescribe it, you know. Uh, so, it, but just to show you, uh, this gentleman, uh, you can see on the photograph there with redness. So this cream makes things red and angry before it clears it up. So, so this treatment, this patient had a treatment with Aphidex cream. so that's important to tell the patient and show the photographs how their face would look like to warn them that the, it will generate inflammatory response to kill those uh, uh, sun damaged cells and it takes 3 uh, th weeks of treatment and then subsequent 3 uh, weeks uh, it will takes things uh, to get better as well so we're talking about 4 to 5 weeks of treatment where the face can look like that you know and so you you, you must warn the patient because they probably would want to do this treatment uh, do not want to do this treatment if they've got any social commitments like wedding or any uh, other event so so that's something for them to be aware of how their face looks like and just to show you example how things uh, you know uh, flare up and then it gets clear and you can see the skin which got, got completely clear and a fresh skin comes up uh, in 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 4 to 5 weeks time so that is what in the treatment for actinic damage so moving on to our next patient is uh, so Spot diagnosis here. I think we're going to move a bit quicker. Acne, uh, acne, acne, acne. Yes. So acne is causing a lot of good signs there. You can see papules. You can see nodules and some blackheads as well, and a lot of scarring. So this patient needs to be referred to the dermatologist straight away. 
any the key message for acne is for all gps or anybody if you seeing a scars from acne please point this is this is not a teenage disease this is classified as a scarring disease it has a, it has a huge impact psychologically on patients and lifelong effect so if you see scars even the child in 10 years 11 year 12 please refer to dermatology again the treatment is divided into mild moderate acne so topical steroid topical retinoid and antibiotics for mild <laughs> And then we step up to oral antibiotics, uh, such as tretralicyl or lamsacrine is considered as a sort of first line antibiotics, or we can go to uh, second lines as erythromycin and trimethoprim. And oral antiantrogen has also have a good impact, especially if they are combined pills uh, with, with both uh, estrogen and progesterone. It, only progesterone doesn't work. And then the main treatment for, as a dermatologist, uh, we go for rocketin or isotretinoin. It's really effective. And roughly, it's about six months to eight months of treatment, and uh, and the important message is with rocketin, it must for females not not to get pregnant because it's an extremely teratogenic drug. So babies born on this medication is highly likely to have birth defects. So uh, we have one minute. Yes, that's fine. I'm going to move forward with my next one. Diagnosis here: Asian child with a white pale skin. I think Mantu knows it. I know it must because I told you about it. Um, but I'll, I'll leave people to see if they can guess it. Yeah, I think it's, it's a petrisis alba. Again, it's a form of a dermatitis. Very common in, in Asians. Can you notice these pale patches and parents who are worried about it? Uh, the key message in this one is reassure the parents. Treat it with topicals, uh, you know, humoate, hydrocortisone, mild steroid. Reassure them. It's benign self-limiting. Give a, you know, a mild moisturizer. And usually they disappear within time and few months time. But key thing is, if you if the child presents it with widespread uh, and uh, hypopigmented widespread uh, uh, scaly patches, then all also think about if it's really getting worse and spreading. Mycosis fungoides or T cell lymphoma can present with these hypopigmented uh, plaques and patches like that. So just be mindful if it's widespread, then think about mycosis fungoides and refer to dermatology. That's the message for, from this slide. The last but not the least, this child uh, uh, at the age of three weeks uh, had this lump grown rapidly, quite, quite quickly. And my parents are really concerned about, about the feeding. Uh, diagnosis, anybody? Sorry? Anyone diagnosis here? Looks some kind of a tumor. It it's an inf infantile hemangioma. Uh, uh, it's a quite uh, common, 5% of the children do get it, and uh, it, it is, uh, uh, we, we 50% 50 of the cases dissolve, resolve by themselves by the age of 5 years, and 70% by the age of 7 years, we reassure them, but we do treat them if it's causing some uh, significant cosmetic issue, or if it's a problem with the function, especially around the periorbital area, and the cheek, and the nose, so this patient would need treatment, and the main treatment is uh, oral Propranolol treatment, we, and, and, and I think you will be surprised that this worked really, really well, oral propranolol treatment, and, uh, uh, but these sort of patients need to be urgently referred to the dermatology team if there is, a, uh, if there is any risk of any problem with the functions uh, uh, like uh, feeding or breathing or around the, or the vision problem, and they need to be referred within two weeks. Uh, they, are, can, they can be associated with other syndromes as well, uh, which our faces and lumbar, they are characterized by other cardiac and renal anomalies. So, uh, so that's uh, capillary hemangioma. I think I'm going to finish it off uh, by here. Thank you very much, guys. Any questions? Thank you very much, uh, Maz. Thank you, Zafar, for excellent talks. So I think uh, because of time, we may have time for maybe one or two questions. Um, so if anyone wants to ask a question, I think Sakit raised hand before. Sakit, do you have a question? I can't even see Sakit. He's not breaking his team, man. Um, no, so so I may ask uh, a question. Um, yes. the, the sleep apnea thing, so I understand you have to have some structural abnormality in the neck or at some part of your sort of higher up to cause this obstruction. Um, but does obesity alone can give you sleep apnea? For example, you have a completely normal neck, but you are just massively overweight. Can that yep. causes sleep apnea actually? 
Absolutely, it can. So that's what I was trying to say that, you know, even obesity is not, so obesity, when you're obese, they would definitely have more submucosal fat in the neck anyway. So they don't have to have any obstruction like big tonsils or big tongue anyway. And there are other physiological factors as we talked about, you know, the body's compensatory mechanism and their surface tension and their craniofacial anatomy. So there's lots of other factors which can, so yes, a person can, even a person may not be obese and he might still have sleep apnea. So let alone just obesity. So obesity, yes, you, answer to your question is yes. Short answer is yes. Okay, thank you. Any, que any more questions? Sorry, who is speaking? I'm not sure, but I think, no. Um, Saqib, Mohammed Faisal, any more questions? Anani, thank you. Uh, I, I asked, well done, very interactive. Uh, I really enjoyed. Uh, think it's too early for you guys. Thanks for changing that time just because of me. Uh, no, thank you very much, Zafar. And uh, I think we should call you next year to talk about COPD and inhalers. Yeah. I think was there. I'm not still there. Maybe he can put, shed some light on that. If he's still there, Mason is he still there? Uh, Mason has left. Okay, sure. No okay, so the next webinar is going to be on the 5th of May, which is a Sunday. Again, um, timing. Zafar, will Zafar still there? Um, yeah. So I think, uh, Mansoor, have you got speakers for next? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I have actually got Masood Ansari. Zafa, you'll be delighted. Masood is presenting on the 5th of May. I'm definitely watching his, his talk. That we, want that <laughs> we just need pictures like um, us. And I have asked uh, Shazad. Shazad is just yet to come back to me. So Shazad should be. You can, can you, Mansoor, can you, can you Mansoor, ask? Could you ask uh, Mansoor, could you ask, uh, uh, you know, to him to present uh, uh, his cases as well? You know, live cases, that would be fun. He okay. does, he does do that. Actually, he presented that at one of the Dogans and then it, yeah. it was with the families and we were very, very impressed.